Welcome to the second of two Humanities Department poetry readings. Um, today's poet, uh, Martin Espada, has, uh, it's neat to have him here. I'm not gonna go on and on about him because I gave that privilege to, to Frank, who uh, likes the limelight better than I do. But uh, I've had great conversations with this man in cars driving him around, and uh, I think he's probably, uh, one of the most important poets in uh, Latino literature right now, uh, certainly in this area and certainly from the Puerto Rican community. So I'm glad to, that you've come to uh, to hear him because you should. Okay, and I'm gonna. This is Frank Reyes who's gonna say a few more words about Martin. Hi, my name is Frank Reyes. <clears throat> and um, it is my pleasure because uh, for the past two months I've been more or less ODing on most of the poems that Martin Espada has written. I heard, um, you're not supposed to mispronounce his name, it's Martin. Uh, to me he's been an inspiration. Some of the things that he has written has truly showed struggle and, and, uh, and overcoming these struggles. Without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Martin Espada. Bueno, muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? All right. Um, I guess that's it. <laughs> yeah. See, I'm uh, I'm six foot three. When I get one of these mics that only comes up to there, I, I start bending over and I look like something right off an evolution chart. You know. <laughs> so yeah, I'll get a little help over. This is a technical college, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> And one thing leads to another, then I get, you know, muscle spasms in my back, then I have to go into painkillers, and I lie around on bed all day, which is not such a bad thing. Jeez, maybe they should have left the podium down. Okay, yeah, my name is Martin Espada. Frank certainly got it right. And um, what I want to do is uh, reading. I want to read from uh, several of my books, and I'll even read one new poem. It isn't in a book yet. And then I want to leave some time for questions, and then after the questions, I think it's supposed to be a book signing. So, um, of course, be happy to do that. Um, I know some of you have been in a class uh, with John, and you've been reading this book called Rebellion is the Circle of a Lover's Hands. And so I do want to read some poems from this uh, volume. I'm going to start with a poem that I like to start with. It's called Colibri. And Colibri is one of the Spanish words for hummingbird. Um, this is a story that actually takes us back 500 years in the history of Puerto Rico. 500 years back, before the island of Puerto Rico was even known by that name, it was called Boriquen. And the people of the island called themselves by that same name, Boriquen. They were the people that today we would call Indians, the original indigenous inhabitants of the island of Puerto Rico. And then the Spanish came with Columbus in the second voyage of 1493, and they conquered these people, not only with guns and swords, which you might expect, but also with words because words are also instruments of power. And so these people were called Tainos, which was not their name. And they were called Indians, and then they were gone. And it's the old story, warfare and slavery and disease. But you can still see the Taino in many places in Puerto Rico today. You can see them in the, uh, in the petroglyphs, the rock carvings, gods and animals they left behind. You can hear them in the music, the maracas come from the Taino. And you can also see it in the people themselves, the copper complexion of many people on the island, including my own father, who comes from Utuado, way up in the mountains of Puerto Rico, which was a Taino stronghold at one time. And so all this history came together for me and for my wife when we visited the mountains of Puerto Rico and stayed in a place called Jayuya, not far from Utuado. And uh, there it was that we saw a hummingbird caught inside a building. And that's where this poem 
uh, takes off from. Uh, I'm going to do the poem first in Spanish and then in English. This book is fully bilingual. And if you don't speak Spanish, just uh, check out the music of the words, because it's a very musical language, and uh, the English will be right along behind it. <coughs> Colibri, para mi esposa Catherine un año después. En Jayuya, los lagartijos se dispersan como una flota de canoas verdes ante el invasor. Los españoles conquistaron con hierro y palabras. Indio taíno para el pueblo que tomaba la vida de la lluvia arrojada entre los árboles como flechas evaporándose. Ellos que dejaron huellas en la roca de ojos y bocas en círculos perfectos de espanto. Y el zumbador fue bautizado colibrí. Ahora el colibrí se precipita y se estrella entre los muros blancos de la hacienda un corazón taíno agitado frenético, como si oyera el bramido del dios de la pólvora por primera vez. El colibrí, fresa paralizada, calle en la más pura que tú, cuando tus manos lo acopan y lo alzan por los celosías rojas de la ventana, donde se desaparece en un paraíso celeste, un anochecer de coquilles. Si la historia solo fuera como tus manos, Colibri for my wife Catherine one year later. In Hayuya, the lizards scatter like a fleet of green canoes before the invader. The Spanish conquered with iron and words. Indio, Taino, for the people who took life from the rain that rushed through trees like evaporating arrows, who left the rock carvings of eyes and mouths in perfect circles of amazement. So the hummingbird was christened Colibri. Now the Colibri darts and bangs between the white walls of the hacienda, a racing Taino heart, frantic as if hearing the bellowing god of gunpowder for the first time. The Colibri becomes pure stillness, seized in the paralysis of the prey when your hands cup the bird and lift him through the red shutters of the window where he disappears into a paradise of sky, a nightfall of singing frogs. If only history were like your hands. Gracias. Oh, you know, at the end of that poem, you know, I refer to uh, singing frogs. Uh, I'm not talking about Kermit. I'm talking about the coqui sings at night in Puerto Rico, much like the cricket does here. Of course, this is the basis of my theory that uh, Kermit the Frog is really Puerto Rican. <laughs> His name is Kermit. They don't tell you this stuff in Hollywood. You know? Well, <clears throat> I am originally from the tropical paradise of Brooklyn, New York. Yeah. From the East New York section of Brooklyn, if you know the city. Yeah. People who know New York City, I say East New York, and I, I get, ooh, low whistles. Anyway, um, when I was a kid, I heard all about this, this island, this Puerto Rico, paradise out there somewhere. And when I was about nine or ten, I finally get a chance to go for the first time. I've been back many times since, but that first time is always the most memorable time. And I discovered there more than I thought I would because I got to paradise and turned out it wasn't quite paradise. That's the problem with paradise. It's never really paradise. And in this case, it had everything to do with the fact that Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States, as some of you know, territory of the US. And one of the byproducts of that is a sort of national inferiority complex. Oh, we're so small, we're so weak, you know, we're not as good as the United States. And, and we tend to prize all things, uh, quote, American at the expense of the small daily miracles around us. That's what I saw my family doing. Anyway, this is how it came out. Uh, the poem itself is called Coca-Cola and Coco Frio. On his first visit to Puerto Rico, island of family folklore, the fat boy wandered from table to table with his mouth open. 
At every table, some great aunt would steer him with cool spotted hands to a glass of Coca-Cola. One even sang to him, in all the English she could remember, a Coca-Cola jingle from the 40s. He drank obediently, though he was bored with this potion, familiar from soda fountains in Brooklyn. Then, at a roadside stand off the beach, the fat boy opened his mouth to coco frio, a coconut chilled then scalped by a machete so that a straw could inhale the clear milk. The boy tilted the green shell overhead and drooled coconut milk down his chin. Suddenly, Puerto Rico was not Coca-Cola or Brooklyn. And neither was he. For years afterward, the boy marveled at an island where the people drank Coca-Cola and sang jingles from World War II in a language they did not speak. While so many coconuts in the trees sagged, heavy with milk, swollen and unsuckled. Well, every Puerto Rican poet should have a cockroach poem. <laughs> this one, I'm proud to say, is mine. I don't even need to tell you it's a true story. It's called My Cockroach Lover. The summer I slept on JC's couch, there were roaches between the bristles of my toothbrush. Roaches pouring from the speakers of the stereo. A light flipped on in the kitchen at night revealed a Republican National Convention of Roaches. <laughs> An Indianapolis 500 of roaches. One night I dreamed a giant roach leaned over me, brushing my face with kind antenna and whispering, I love you. I awoke, slapping myself, and watched the darkness for hours, because I realized this was a dream, and so that meant the cockroach did not really love me. <laughs> That's a very sad poem. It was a very lonely summer, what can I tell you? Well, I sometimes do uh, what I call retratos, portraits of people in the community, and I'll do one of those now. This is also from the book uh, that the class had. And uh, this is a persona poem. That is, I speak in the voice of the person the poem is about. And uh, his name is Jorge. He was a janitor at a church. Um, and uh, it was located in a place called Harvard Square in Cambridge, a bastion of liberalism, or so we were told. And uh, this is his story. Uh, Jorge, the church janitor, finally quits. No one asks where I am from. I must be from the country of janitors. I have always mopped this floor. Honduras, you are a squatter's camp outside the city of their understanding. No one can speak my name. I host a fiesta of the bathroom, stirring the toilet like a punch bowl. The Spanish music of my name is lost when the guests complain about toilet paper. What they say must be true. I am smart, but I have a bad attitude. No one knows that I quit tonight. Maybe the mop will push on without me, sniffing along the floor like a crazy squid with stringy gray tentacles. They will call it Jorge. Here's another retrato, um, and this one comes from my experience in another way. Uh, I ended up, believe it or not, going to law school. I went to Northeastern University Law School in Boston, and um, I don't know how I got there. I mean, I, I was a spectacularly bad student. I once failed English in the eighth grade. Well, I failed typing, too. Failed math. <laughs> failed gym. How the hell do you fail Jim? <laughs> so anyway, that got me into law school. And um, it, 
It was a place, uh, Northeastern is a very unusual law school. They have a program called co-op, where in your second and third year, you go out to work. And so they uh, sent me to a place called the Migrant Legal Action Program in Washington, D.C., my second year. Um, and they, in turn, sent me into the fields and labor camps of Maryland and Delaware to do outreach in Spanish among farm workers and explain their legal rights to them. Um, and uh, I saw a lot of things, I heard a lot of things, and wrote a series of farm worker poems. This is one of them. It's called Federico's Ghost. The story is that whole families of fruit pickers still crept between the furrows of the field at dusk, when, for reasons of whiskey or whatever, the crop duster plain sprayed anyway, floating a pesticide drizzle over the pickers who thrashed like dark birds in a glistening white net. Except for Federico, a skinny boy who stood apart in his own green row, and knowing the pilot would not understand in Spanish that he was the son of a whore, instead jerked his arm and thrust an obscene finger. The pilot understood. He circled the plane and sprayed again, watching a fine gauze of poison drift over the brown bodies that cowered and scurried on the ground and aiming for Federico, leaving the skin beneath his shirt wet and blistered, but still pumping his finger at the sky. After Federico died, rumors at the labor camp told of tomatoes picked and smashed at night Growers muttering of vandal children are communists in camp, first threatening to call immigration, then promising every Sunday off if only the smashing of tomatoes would stop. Still, tomatoes were picked and squashed in the dark, and the old women in camp said it was Federico, laboring after sundown to cool the burns on his arms flinging tomatoes with that crop duster that hung like a mosquito lost in his ear and kept his soul awake. So John said to me, why don't you do some of those really short poems? And I like the really short poems because they don't take too long to write. Here's a really short poem. <clears throat> uh, this is a poem that comes from one of my earlier books, and uh, it's also based on a legal experience. Uh, this uh, this uh, poem is based on an actual exchange that took place in federal district court in Boston. And uh, the only thing you need to know to get the poem, the poem is bilingual. The only thing you need to know to get the poem is that there's a mistranslation right in the middle. And uh, that makes sense because for Latinos, the legal system is nothing but a series of mistranslations anyway. So, this poem is called, Mariano Explains Yankee Colonialism to Judge Collings. Judge, does the prisoner understand his rights? Interpreter, entiende usted sus derechos? Prisoner, pal carajo. Interpreter, yes. <laughs> Like, yes, he understands his rights. Yeah, carajo. Yeah. That's, by the way, carajo doesn't mean yes. So. <laughs> probably figured that out, right? Yeah, he probably got that. Yeah. What does it mean? That's one of those words you could do like a whole seminar and try to translate that. Just, just don't say it, okay? Don't use that word. Forget I ever introduced you to it. You never heard it. Yeah. Just suffice it to say, it's, it's, a, it's a bad word. It's a bad, just, you better have both hands free when you say it, that's all I got to say. Well, <clears throat> yeah, okay, mm. yeah, don't say, you didn't hear it from me. Okay, um, I worked for six years in a place called Chelsea, Massachusetts. Chelsea is right outside of Boston. It's the poorest city in the state of Massachusetts. It's a gateway city, a city of immigrants, always has been. And now the immigrants come from the Spanish-speaking Caribbean, in Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and they also come from Central America, Guatemala, Salvador, and they come from Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia. 
And um, the housing stock there is, of course, the worst in the entire state. So they needed help in the area of housing. And I became a housing lawyer, a tenant lawyer. Uh, the program I worked for was called Su Clinica Legal. Su Clinica Legal, a legal services program for low-income Spanish-speaking tenants there in Chelsea. And I wrote a series of poems based on that experience. And here's one of them. Uh, tires stacked in the hallways of civilization, Chelsea, Massachusetts. Yes, Your Honor, they are rodents, said the landlord to the judge. But I let the tenant have a cat. <laughs> Besides, he stacks his tires in the hallway. The tenant confessed in stuttering English. Yes, Your Honor, I am from El Salvador, and I put my tires in the hallway. The judge puffed up his robes like a black bird shaking off rain, tires out of the hallway. You don't live in a jungle anymore. This is a civilized country. So the defendant was ordered to remove his tires from the hallways of civilization and allowed to keep the cat. You ever seen those cat calendars, like those really cute cat calendars? Yeah. I want to get that poem in one of those cat calendars. <laughs> That's my cat poem. Well, after my cat poem, it's time for my bathroom poem. It's, it's kind of weird, you know, I've published something like 150 poems. This is the one that everybody knows. And I'm not sure how I feel about it, because it's basically a toilet poem. <laughs> but, yeah, you take what you can get, right? Um, what happened was this. Before I worked for Suclinica, I worked for an operation called Meta uh, in, uh, in Boston. And Meta is a nonprofit public interest law firm. They do bilingual education law, one of the very few places in the country that does that. And um, one day we got a call from Lynn, Massachusetts, not too far away. I said, please come over to Lynn English High School. Over at the high school, they have just banned Spanish at lunchtime. Can't, can't speak Spanish at lunchtime. Can't do that. So we went over, we had a hearing with the principal, and we explained to him that he had to read a document called <clears throat> the Constitution. And we read it to him. And uh, they changed their policy, right? Um, but one of the advantages of being a poet is the opportunity for revenge. So I wrote this little poem as an act of vengeance. Um, it's called The New Bathroom Policy in English High School. It's a very short poem, so I'm gonna do it first in Spanish and then in English. And you'll see why I did it in Spanish as soon as you hear the English. Um, Nueva Norma para el Baño en la English High School. Uh, you'll notice the translation of English High School. Los muchachos cacaren español en el baño mientras el principal de la escuela los oye desde el inodoro. La única palabra que reconoce es su propio nombre. Y esto le da estreñimiento. Por tanto, decide prohibir el español en los baños. Ahora puede recalarse. <laughs> the new bathroom policy at English High School. The boys chatter Spanish in the bathroom while the principal listens from his stall. The only word he recognizes is his own name. And this constipates him. <laughs> so he decides to ban Spanish in the bathrooms. Now he can relax. <laughs> mm. Somebody asked me not too long ago, I said, well, how come he wasn't in his own bathroom? How come he wasn't in the staff bathroom? And I said, because it's my poem. <laughs> well, here's a poem now where I want to back up and pay tribute to my father, my father, Frank Espada, a um, longtime uh, activist in the Puerto Rican community going back to the uh, late 50s, early 60s. But he was really radicalized in the year 1949. My father was 19 years old, and he was um, stationed at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. He'd run away from home and join the Air Force. And my father took a Trailways bus across the South, 1949, around Christmas time, to see his family in New York City. 
And when the bus stopped in Mississippi, he was told to get to the back. He refused to go. My father was pulled off the bus by a couple of cops who brought him in front of a magistrate in the middle of the night, got a judge out of bed for this. And the judge looked at him, and the way my father tells the story is complete with the accent. The judge said to him, boy, how many days you got on that furlough? And my father said, seven days, Your Honor. And the judge said, I hereby sentence you to seven days in the county jail. And so my father spent his Christmas sitting in a Mississippi jail. And he said it was the best week of his life. He figured out what he wanted to do with the rest of his life. Was, and that was to fight this. And that's what he did. Now my father doesn't make it into the history books. He's anonymous, but he's one of thousands and thousands of people who did things like this, anonymously, anonymously. And they were the backbone of what we came to call the Civil Rights Movement. Now, lately we've learned more and more about the Civil Rights Movement, right? documentaries like Eyes on the Prize and so on, so more of us at least have some idea of what the history was and the facts, but too often we forget that history. We forget that legacy of struggle which has been left to us, and that's our greatest treasure. That tradition of struggle, that tradition of fighting back, that's the greatest thing we have. It's worth more than all the money in the world. So often we forget. And so this is a poem about that. This is a poem about historical amnesia. It's a poem against forgetting, and it's a poem about remembering the traditions of struggle that we all come from. Right? And so the first part of the poem is about the freedom riders, the freedom riders who were trying to desegregate public transportation in the South, both white and black. And the second part of the poem is about my father, I don't mention his name in the poem because, as I said before, he's not in the history books. He's anonymous. But we can't fall asleep again. And this poem is called Sleeping on the Bus. How we drift in the twilight of bus stations. How we shrink in overcoats as we sit. How we wait for the loudspeaker to tell us when the bus is leaving. How we bang on soda machines for lost silver. How bewildered we are at the vision of our own faces in white-lit bathroom mirrors. How we forget the bus stations of Alabama, Birmingham to Montgomery. How the Freedom Riders were abandoned to the beckoning mob. How afterwards their faces were tender and lopsided as spoiled fruit, fingers searching the mouth for lost teeth and how the riders, descendants of Africa and Europe, both kept riding, even as the mob with pleading hands wept fiercely for the ancient laws of segregation. How we forget Biloxi, Mississippi, a decade before, where no witnesses spoke to cameras, how a brown man in army uniform was pulled from the bus by police when he sneered at the custom of the back seat, how the magistrate proclaimed a week in jail and went back to bed with a shot of whiskey, how the brown-skinned soldier could not sleep as he listened for the prowling of his jailers, the muttering and card-playing of the hangmen they might become. His name is not in the index. He did not tell his family for years how he told me, and still I forget. How we doze upright on buses. How the night overtakes us in the babble of headphones. How the singing and clapping of another generation fade like distant radio as we ride, forehead heavy on the window. How we sleep, how we sleep. I mentioned he was in army uniform. That's because at that time the Air Force was still part of the army. Little thing. Um, <clears throat> now I want to introduce you to my wife's family. That's a very different experience. Um, my wife's family comes from a mythical place called Rocky Hill. <laughs> I'm still convinced it doesn't really exist. But if you go down the highway, there's a sign that says Rocky Hill, and you can actually get off at that exit, and there are houses and people living there. Um, my wife introduced me, when we started going out, she decided to bring me to her family for Thanksgiving. Now, her family was operating on the assumption 
that the Puerto Ricans are supposed to stay in Hartford. <laughs> and there I was, asking for a drumstick. So this is the story of the first time I had Thanksgiving with my wife's family. And I was a little tense. And uh, you will uh, hear a lot of incredible things. And I have to tell you before I start this poem, there's something you've heard of called poetic license, where the poets got the right to make stuff up. I didn't make up any of this. <laughs> I, OK. It's just called Thanksgiving. This was the first Thanksgiving with my wife's family, sitting at the stained pine table in the dining room. The wood stove coughed during her mother's prayer, amen, and the gravy boat bobbing over fresh linen. Her father stared into the mashed potatoes and saw a white battleship floating in the gravy. Still staring at the mashed potatoes, he began a soliloquy about the new Navy missiles fired across miles of ocean, how they could jump into the smokestack of a battleship. Now in Korea, he said, I was a gunner, and the people there ate kimchi, and it really stinks. <laughs> Mother complained that no one was eating the creamed onions. Eat, Daddy. The creamed onions looked like eyeballs, I thought, <laughs> and then said, I wish I had missiles like that. Daddy laughed a 1950s horror movie mad scientist laugh and told me he didn't have a missile, but he had his own cannon. Daddy, eat the candied yams. Mother hissed, as if he were a liquored CIA spy telling secrets about military hardware to some Puerto Rican janitor he met in a bar. I'm a tool maker. I made the cannon myself, he announced, and left the table. <laughs> Daddy's family has been here in the Connecticut Valley since 1680, Mother said. There were Indians here once, but they left. <laughs> When I started dating her daughter, mother called me a half-black, but now she plopped candied yams on my plate. I nibbled at the candied yams. I remembered my own Thanksgivings in the Bronx, turkey with arroz y bichuelas and platanos, and countless cousins swaying to boogaloo on the record player or roaring at my grandmother's Spanish punchlines in the kitchen, the glowing of her cigarette like a firefly lost in the city. For years, I thought everyone ate rice and beans with turkey at Thanksgiving. <laughs> Daddy returned to the table with a cannon, steering the black iron barrel. Does that cannon go boom, I asked. <laughs> I fire it in the backyard at the tombstones, he said. That cemetery bought up all our farmland during the Depression. Now we only have the house. He stared and said nothing, then glanced up suddenly like a ghost that tickled his ear. Want to see me fire it, he grinned. <laughs> Daddy, fire the cannon after dessert, Mother said. If I fire the cannon, I have to take out the cannonballs first, he told me. He tilted the cannon downward, and cannonballs dropped from the barrel, thudding on the floor and rolling across the brown braided rug. Grandmother praised the turkey's thighs, said she would bring leftovers home to feed her Congo gray parrot. I walked with Daddy to the backyard, past the bullet holes in the door, and his pickup truck with the Confederate license plate. He swiveled the cannon around to face the tombstones on the other side of the backyard fence. This way, if I hit anybody, they're already dead, he declared. <laughs> he stuffed half a charge of gunpowder into the cannon and lit the fuse. From the dining room, Mother yelled, Daddy, no! Then the battlefield rumbled under my feet. My head thundered. Smoke drifted over the tombstones. Daddy laughed, and I thought, when the first drunken pilgrim dragged out the cannon at the first Thanksgiving, that's when the Indians left. <laughs> side of that family. I mean, obviously, that's kind of a crazy story, but um, there's a sinister side to it, you know, which is that my, 
my wife grew up in this family. And, um, you know, her father did some things to her that stayed with her for many years after that, even to the point where she had a, a child, our son, Clemente, who was born on December 28, 1991. And uh, this is a poem I call White Birch. Uh, it's a poem, well, the title comes from my wife's favorite tree. The white birch trees will grow everywhere around here. And in the poem, the white birch tree becomes a symbol for her body, for her bones, and for her strength. Um, and you'll see the reason why, because there was uh, a miracle that had to happen for this birth to take place. And uh, the reason for that is something that happened to my wife many years earlier the hands of her father, which the poem will explain. Um, again, the poem is called White Birch, and it's uh, from my wife, Catherine, December 28th, 1991. Two decades ago, rye whiskey scalded your father's throat, stinking from the mouth as he stamped his shoe in the groove between your hips, dizzy flailing cartwheel down the stairs. The tail of your spine split, became a scraping Hook. For 20 years, a fire raced across the bowels of your bones, his drunken mouth, a movie flashing with every stabbed gesture. Now, the white room of birth is throbbing, the numbers palpitating red on the screen of machinery tentacled to your arm, the oxygen mask wedged in a wheeze on your face, the numbing medication injected through the spine. The boy was snagged on that spiraling Medical fingers prodded your raw pink center while you stared at a horizon of water no one else could see, creatures leaping silver with tails that slashed the air like your agonized tongue. You were born in the river valley, hard green checkerboard of farms, a town of white birches and a churchyard from the workhorse time, weathered headstones naming women drained of blood with infants coiled inside the caging hips, hymns swaying as if lanterns over the mounded earth. Then the white birch of your bones, resilient and yielding, yielded again. Roots snapped as the boy spilled out of you into hands burst open by beckoning and voices pouring praise like water. Two beings tangled in exhaustion, blood painted but full of breath. After a generation of burning, the hook unfurled in your body, the crack in the bone dissolved. One day you stood, expected again the branch of nerves fanning across your back to flame and felt only the grace of birches. Well, it's almost 11 o'clock, and I want to leave a few minutes for questions, so I'm going to finish with this, uh, this last poem. And it's a poem that brings us not only to the present, but to the future, and that is my son Clemente, who is now five years old. Uh, he was just measured at exactly four feet tall, and like the cheetah, he reaches speeds of up to 60 miles an hour. <laughs> anyway, uh, it almost didn't work out that way. Clemente was six weeks old. Uh, he developed something uh, called RSV. It's a virus that causes not only pneumonia, but heart failure in infants. And he was hospitalized, and we moved into the hospital with him. And this is the story of what happened next. Uh, the poem ends with a kind of prayer, a prayer for not only what Clemente may become, but the world around him too. And so it's a prayer not just for him, but for all our children. And I'll finish uh, with this poem. Um, the uh, literal Spanish meaning of his name, Clemente, is merciful. And everybody thinks he's named for the ball player. Okay, he's, he's really named for a poet. And his name means merciful. So that's where the title of this poem comes from. Because Clemente means merciful. For Clemente Gilbert Espada, February 1992. At 3 a.m., we watch the emergency room doctor press a thumb against your cheekbone to bleach your eye with light. The spinal fluid was clear, drained from the hole in your back, but the x-ray film drew a stain on the lung, explained the seizing cough, the wailing heat of fever. Pneumonia at the age of six weeks, a bedside vigil. 
Your mother slept beside you, the stitches of birth still burning. When I asked, will he be okay? No one would answer, yes. I closed my eyes and dreamed my father dead, naked on a steel table as I turned away. In the dream, when I looked again, my father had become my son. So the hospital kept us. The oxygen mask, a frayed wire taped to your toe for reading the blood, the medication forgotten from shift to shift, a doctor bickering with radiology over the film, the bald girl with a cancerous rib removed, the pediatrician who never called, the yawning intern, the hospital roommate's father from Guatemala ignored by the doctors as if he had picked their morning coffee. The check marks and initials at 5 a.m. The pages of forms flipping like a deck of cards, record keeping for the records office, the lawyers, and the morgue. One day, while the laundry in the basement hissed white sheets and sheets of paper documented dwindling breath, you spat mucus, gulped air, and lived. We listen to the bassoon of your lungs, the cadenza of the next century resonate. The Guatemalan father did not need a stethoscope to hear the breathing, and he grinned. I grinned too, and because Clemente means merciful, stood beside the Guatemalteco, repeating in Spanish everything that was not said to him. I know someday you'll stand beside the Guatemalan fathers. Speak in the tongue of all the shunned faces. Breathe in a music we have never heard. And live by the meaning of your name. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. OK. Well, as I say, we have a few minutes for questions. And then I'll be a book sign. There's a book. Okay, books are here, so there'll be a book signing afterwards. Uh, signatures are free, of course. Um, but um, I know some people have been reading my work. I also have heard there's some poets here, and I know they're probably the kind of poets that like to uh, hide everything they write, but I know who you are. I can tell just by looking. Right. So anyway, um, if there are any questions, now is the time. Don't leave me up here by myself. Yes. different ways of answering that. I, uh, much of my earlier work especially, I would combine the two languages and bounce back and forth between them. I do less of that now than I used to, perhaps. Um, but what I discovered was translation. So that's the other way of integrating my Spanish and my English, is that I, you know, the poem will come out first in English and then it's translated into Spanish, okay? um, which can be a tremendous pain, by the way. I mean, translation is one of these things that's like busting rock. You know, and there's always more rock. I mean, you can always do a better job. There's always another way of translating something. And so it makes me kind of nuts. And, and one time I swore I'd rather get my beard caught in a sewing machine than do it again. But occasionally I still do it. Translate, not get my beard caught in a sewing machine. Um, but what you, you know, what you refer to Spanish, you know, I call it code switching. We go back and forth between one language and the other for emphasis, for effect. And the thing to understand, I guess, about code switching, whether you see it in poetry or hear it in conversation, is that it's not an accident. It's not an accident. It's not something we do because we are inadequate linguistically, which is the assumption a lot of people make. You, know, you hear the term people will use the word, the word Spanglish, not that you were using it this way, but some people will use the word Spanglish in a derogatory way. Oh, well, they speak Spanglish. And the idea being that we are uh, basically illiterate in two languages. Whereas code switching is a very sophisticated thing that's going on, all right? And we switch back and forth between ma languages for all kinds of purposes, for emphasis, for drama, for irony, for humor, for the very music of the language, for effect. It's a strategy. It's not an accident, right? And it's a sign of our intelligence, not our stupidity, right? So that's something I think we have to remember the next time we run into that, you know? Yeah. Who is Maynard Gilbert? My father. 
father's, uh, my father-in-law. Yeah, yeah. Well, that poem is much more sympathetic with him. I mean, because you know, the fact is, I talk about my, my look. My 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 father-in-law scares the hell out of me. But you know, there are reasons why you know he is the way he is. And what we can never forget is that even in situations where, let's say, a Puerto Rican working class is 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 put right next to a white working class, and we're basically asked to fight it out over the lion's share of the crumbs, we got to remember where they come from too. You know, and we got to remember that they're, they're cannon fodder also in all this nation's wars, you know, and that they have been distracted by racism. They have been led to believe that we're the enemy. We're not the enemy. We know we're not the enemy, but that is the line that's been bought by so much of the white working class that, you know, the problem is the blacks and the Puerto Ricans, you know, and we have much more in common than we're ever led to believe, right? Because they've been distracted. Look over here, look over here, your problems, people on welfare, you know, please. Let's talk about corporate welfare. Let's talk about the welfare at the top. You know, let's talk about the people who make millions and millions and don't pay a cent in taxes. Let's talk about some of that. And then the working class in this country might figure out who the real enemy is. I got carried away. tend to write in his or her first language. And I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. My first language is English. There are some places in Brooklyn where English is still spoken. And, you know, um, and so that's how it had turned out. But, you know, I, I, I see this as, you know, an, an advantage of having the two languages to work with, and I'm always trying to move my poetry from one language to the other at all times. I mean, this is a great resource we have, to have two languages, which is why I'm always amused by the English-only folks you know, U.S. English should come along and say, well, you know, we, you know, the, the cultural fabric of our nation is threatened because of people just speaking languages other than English. You know, and basically what I feel like is like I have two coins in my hands, you know, English and Spanish. I have two coins in my hands, those languages. And you're telling me by taking one coin out of my hand, I'm going to be richer somehow? I don't buy it. Yeah, my father, like all fathers, I think, to one degree or another, my father has mixed feelings, right? I mean, first of all, I mean, I guess I should be grateful that my father has any feelings at all. All right, so there. But my father, on one, on one level, is very proud of me, and on another level, I kind of make him nervous because it's not always a blessing to have a poet in the family. <laughs> Poets tell family secrets, all right? Poets put out your dirty laundry. You know, poets are embarrassing. You know, it's like that crazy uncle at the dinner table who's yelling about socialism or, or, or yelling about the neighbors upstairs or he's embarrassing the hell out of you. You know, that's, that's a poet. That's what it's like to have a poet in the family, you know. And um, my father's gotten pretty mad at me for some of the poems I've written, but it didn't stop me from writing them. In fact, the worst thing in the world you can say to a poet is, don't say that. <laughs> because the next thing you know, there's a whole book about it. All right, you just cannot tell a poet to shut up. Worst thing you could do. You know, that's like pouring, pouring oil on the flames. Say, Hold on a second, let me get the oil. You know? So, big mouth, that's my job. Yes? Is that poetry? Well, <laughs> hell yes. Um, well, first of all, you're absolutely right. Even to this day, in high school and college, the kind of poetry we usually get is the kind of poetry that has nothing to do with our experience, right? It's boring. I mean, and now you can feel okay about that because I said it was boring. It's boring. I'm bored with it. And, you know, I know what I'm looking at. Uh, the fact of the matter is, you got to remember that the poetry we read or is forced upon us 
comes from a curriculum that's determined by class, by race, and by all the things that, that determine everything else in the society. Why should poetry be immune? You know? And so, you know, we're looking, you know, you read, uh, you know, Shelley or one of those cats from way back. I mean, these folks didn't have to work for a living. You know? I mean, they were, they were rolling in dough, so they wrote poems and eventually, you know, it was a self-destructive thing and they ended up sort of offing themselves, you know? Um, but the fact of the matter is that when I respond to this, when I hear that what I'm doing is not poetry, my response is, you mean to tell me that my life and the life of my community is not the stuff of poetry? What are the assumptions you are making? You know, why is it we always hear, oh, poetry can be about anything, except that, and that, and that, and that, and that. And pretty soon, poetry can only be about, uh, you know, going horseback riding, you know, or, or watching your servants tend the garden or some crap like that, you know. The reality is that we have bought that myth. We in these communities have bought that myth that our lives are not the stuff of poetry. And that's crap. We are the stuff of poetry, right? Poetry is not something that happens to somebody else far away in the cloud somewhere, Mount Olympus. Poetry happens to us every day. All we have to do is look around us and see it. Paolo Neruda, the great Chilean poet, made poetry out of everything, everything. You read his odes. He wrote, a, you know, write, wrote an ode to lemon. He wrote an ode to tomato. He wrote an ode to his uh, stamp album. He wrote an ode to a dictionary. He, you know, he wrote an ode to the village movie theater. He fell down once, hit his head, and wrote an ode to his cranium. <laughs> right? Poetry can be about anything. And we have to start writing the poetry that speaks of our lives. Because if we don't do it, who's going to do it? Right? The media? Good luck. Right. Look at what they do to us every day in the media. There's something that I see in the media, the television Hartford and Springfield, on the evening news. Right? It's, it's like what I call the third world minute. The third world minute. At the beginning of the newscast, you get the third world minute, and that's where you see whatever Puerto Rican or African American defendant is being arraigned that day. Right? Or you see the blood stain on the sidewalk. And two or three people pointing to it. Ah, see, see, you know, it's take do ID, you know. That's where he fell down, yep, that's where he died. You know, that's not us. How come you never see a story about, you know, the, the, the African-American or, or Puerto Rican poet? How come you haven't seen Kate Russian on television here? How come you haven't seen the social workers? And how come you haven't seen the teachers? You know, folks like John, you know, who devote themselves to this community selflessly. How come you haven't seen the African American and, and, and Latino people who are doing the same thing every single day in Hartford High School or Buckley? How come you don't see the folks who, you know, the, the African American or Puerto Rican nurses working in the emergency room? Where are the heroes? Well, they're out there every day. You're sitting right next to them. And all you have to do is write their stories. Because if you don't do it, it's not going to happen. And that is poetry. Was your work included in the um, Carolyn Porsche against forgetting? No. It wasn't. No. See, I, I have that collection, but I was kind of dissatisfied with the way that she defines political poetry. Mm -hmm. And I felt like you should have been in there, and Ernesto Cardinal was, not, was also not included right. in that. So I was just wondering if you have any ideas about, or any feelings about not being included as a political mm -hmm. poet. Well, you know, you've got to remember that the literary establishment, even those who are political, are still very Eurocentric. Right? This is the education they received. And they have a hard time breaking through that. So even if they have good intentions, and I think she does, that's a very Euro Eurocentric anthology. I mean, Africa, Asia, and Latin America are barely there at all. It's supposed to be a world anthology. And where do we start with that book? Armenia. Yeah. Well, you know, Armenia has a tale to tell, but so does the rest of the world. Um, and I think we have to be on guard against that, that there, you know, there are folks out there who mean well and still manage to leave us out. And it's one thing to be excluded by the mainstream. You expect that. But then to be excluded by the alternative is doubly frustrating, because then there's nowhere left to go after that. And so the final answer is we have to build our own institutions, our own publishers, uh, our own anthologies, you know, and that doesn't mean excluding anybody. That doesn't mean excluding anybody. In fact, you know, if you think about it, since we're quote unquote minorities, by definition, we have to build coalitions to survive. All right, we have to find people who have something in common with us 
and join hands because otherwise we are in serious trouble, even more serious than we think we are. And so it's not about excluding anybody, but it is about making sure that your own voice gets heard because you leave it up to certain people, they forget you. Speaking of. Yeah, Poetry Like Bread, which is the anthology that I edited, available in fine bookstores everywhere. Um, <laughs> it's probably available here. Um, so anyway, that's, you know, that's what I have to say about that. Yes, uh, I'll take one more question, and I think it's just about 11.15. Yeah. The second question was, I found that conversation with that Thanksgiving the mm -hmm. table absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. It's hard to, hard to believe, it's fascinating. So the, the strange question that came out of that I thought of immediately was, how big was that cannon? <laughs> <laughs> it was a real cannon. I know, but I'm I mean, like six feet long. All right, well, you know, okay, let's, let's see. It, all right, I say it's not one of these like Civil War cannons that's that big like this, but it was the barrel was about <laughs> and around, and then the cannonball. You ever do like you know like candle pin bowling or duck pin bowling? The, the cannonballs were about that size, but being cannonballs, they made a real big impression on me. <laughs> all right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. No, I'm sure he would have fired it in the dining room, but you know, his wife would have gotten real mad at him. <laughs> right. Well, anyway, I'm sure there are more questions, but uh, it is just about 11.15. There are books available. I'll be happy to sign them. And once again, muchas gracias. Thank you very much.